Okay, picking up where we left off in chapter 5, middle of page 57. For two days, ominous quiet hung over the town of Poplar. Collins had been buried, and the faces of the settlers as they gathered about to see the body lowered into the grave proved to Harper how right he had been. No longer was there any doubt or hesitation. Now they were in the fight. He had walked back from that grave filled with triumph. Only a few days longer, and then he would begin the war in earnest. Tom Crockett was a quiet man, but his face was stern and hard as he walked back home beside Sharon. Well, we tried to avoid it, but now it's war, he said. I think the sooner we have some action, the better. Sharon said nothing, but her heart was heavy within her. She no longer thought of Mort Harper. His glamorous, his glamour had faded and Always now, there was were but one man in her thoughts, the tall, shy, hesitant Rock Bannon. She always marveled that a man so hard, so sure of himself with men, horses, or guns could be so quiet and diffident with women. As a matter of fact, Rock Bannon had never seen any woman but an Indian squaw until he was 18 years old in Santa Fe. Rock Bannon had never talked to a woman until he was 20. Now he was 27, and he had probably talked to no more than six or seven white women or girls. With deepening sadness and pain, she realized the killing of Collins had done all they had 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 done all they had hoped to avoid. There would be war now, and knowing her father as she did, she knew the unrelenting stubbornness in him once he was resolved upon a course. She had seen him like this before. He, was, he always sought to avoid trouble, always saw the best in people. Yet when the battle line was laid down, no man would stay, here, stay there longer than Tom Crockett. Only one man was silent on the walk back from the grave, Dud Kitchen. Weak and pale from his own narrow escape, was out for the first time. He was very tired. He was glad when he had, was back in Pagoda's house and could lie down and rest. He was up too soon, he knew, but Collins had been his friend. Now lying alone in the gathering darkness and hearing the low mutter of men's voices in the other room, he was sorry he had gone. He had gone over to the Collins house to see his old friend once before he was buried. And he was there when the widow in Satterfield had dressed him in his Sunday go-to meeting clothes. He saw something then that filled the hole inside of him with horror. He saw what none of them seemed to have noticed, that Collins had been shot in the back. Yet he had seen something more than that, and it was that thing that disturbed him. Dead Kitchen was a friendly, cheerful young man who liked nothing better than to sing and play the mandolin. Yet in his life, from Missouri to Texas, he had more than a little experience with guns. Once, too, he had gone down the river to New Orleans, and he had learned many things on that trip. Among other things, he knew the Dragoon Colt had the impact of an axe and would blow a hole in a man big enough to run a buffalo through, or so it was phrased on the frontier. The hole in Collins had been much smaller. At the point of entry, it had been wide and ugly. At the point of, I'm sorry, at the, it was, um, but much smaller at the point of entry. It had been wide and ugly at the point of exit. Opening the door between the living room kitchen of the Pagones' house, Pike walked in to look at Dud. Better get yourself well, Dud, Pike said. We'll need all hands for this fuss. Was it bad, Pike? Kitchen asked. His voice was faint, and in the dim light, Pike could not see what lay in the younger man's eyes. 
No, I figured it wasn't so bad, Pike said. Only a few shots fired. It was over so quick I scarce got my gun out. That bat Chavez, him and Zapata were fastest. But Pete's horse swung around and spoiled his aim for him. Guess it saved his life, though, because Bat's bullet hit the horse right in the head, between the eyes. The horse reared up and throwed Pete, and I jumped my horse away to keep from getting in a, in a tangle. Lamport, he scored a shot on one of them other fellows. We seen him jerk and seen the blood on him as they were riding off. Dead Kitchen waited a long moment. Then he said, who killed Collins? Purcell seemed to scowl. Don't rightly know. There was a side of shoot going on. <clears throat> Might have been any one of them three. Don't you worry about that. We'll get all three of them. So we won't miss getting the right one. Have they got good guns? Dud asked. I'll bet they have. Same as us, Dragoon Colts. One of them had an old walker though. Big gun too. Shoots like a rifle. After Pike Purcell had gone, Dead Kitchen lay alone in the dark room, thinking. His thought frightened him, and yet he was himself down from a he was himself down from a shot by Zapata, who was on their own side. Collins had been shot in the back. Whatever he had been shot by, Dead Kitchen was willing to take an oath. It had been neither a Walker nor a Dragon Colt. The hole was much smaller. The chest of the man had been frightfully torn. Sometimes men cut their bullets off flat across the nose to make them kill better. Dud had seen that done. It usually tore a man up pretty bad. Chapter 6 here. Johnny Stark brought the news of the fight to Rock Bannon. He was, the bi he was with Bishop at the time, and the old man's face hardened. Well, there it is, Rock. We can't give them any more time now. They've had their chance, and from now on, she'll be open warfare. Bishop looked up at Stark. Take six men back with you. Have Monty go with a buckboard and bring Lou here to the ranch house, where we can have proper care. He can have proper care. You tell Red I want to see him, but he'll be in charge when he goes back. Rock got up and paced the floor. He ran his fingers through his shock of black curly hair. His face was stern and hard. He knew what this meant. One man had gone down, Johnny said. From, this, from his description of the, the man, it would be Collins, one of the good men. That would serve to unite the settlers in a compact lot. Despite all his desire to avoid trouble, they were in for it now, and it would be a case of dog-eat-dog, dog, which should Sharon think of all this. Hastily, he computed the numbers at the town site. Their numbers were still slightly inferior to those of the Bishop Ranch, but due to expected Indian trouble and the stock, many of the Bishop hands must re remain on the far ranges. I'm going out, he said at last. I'm going down to Poplar. Also, I'm going to have a look in, the ca in that canyon where Harper's stuff was cached. You watch yourself, boy, Bishop said. He heaved himself up in his chair. You take care. I'm figuring on you having this ranch, and I ain't wanting to will it to no corpse. Rock hurried down to the corral and saw Johnny Stark leading out the still dust all saddled and ready. I figured you'd be right, Rock, he said grimly. He handed his reins to him and started to turn away, then he stepped back. Rock, he said, something I've been going to tell. Something I've been going to tell somebody. I forgot to mention it back there. Rock, I don't think any of us killed Collins. Ben wheeled and grabbed the cow hand by the arm. His eyes were like steel. What do you mean? Give it to me quick. Hey, Johnny said, ease up on that arm, he grinned. You got a grip like a bear trap, he rubbed his arm. Well, I've been thinking about that ever since. Bat was thinking only of Zapata. I shot at that Miller, the guy you whipped. I got his horse. Lou, he burned that long, lean mountain man along the cheek, trying for a headshot. Actually, this here Collins hombre was off to our left. None of us shot that way. You sure about that? Bannon demanded. His mind was working swiftly. If one thing would arouse anger against Bishop among the settlers, 
it would be the killing of one of their own number, and particularly one so well liked as Collins had been. Bannon stared at the rider. Did you see anybody near him? Who was over at that side? This here Collins hombre who got shot was in the front rank, Johnny said. Then there was a heavy set sandy sort of guy with a beard and a tall hombre in a white hat with a dark coat. The bearded man would be Lamport. The man in the white hat was Mort Harper. Rock Bannon swung a leg over the saddle. Johnny, you tell Red to sit tight, he said. I'm riding to Poplar. Want me along? Stark asked eagerly. You better take some help. <clears throat> Those hombres are killing now. They're in a sweat, all of them. Rock shook his head. No, I'll go alone, he said. Tell Red to wait at the cabin. Rock wheeled the gray and cut across the valley. There was still a chance to avoid a battle if he could get to Poplar in time. Yet he had a feeling that Harper would not wait. Hostilities had begun, and that was what he had been playing for all the time. Mm, excuse me. Now he had his excuse to wipe out the bishop forces, and he would be quick to take advantage of it. Yet before he was halfway down the valley, he reined in on the slope of a low hill. Miles to the south, he could see a group of horsemen cutting across toward the line cabin. Bat Chavez was there alone with the wounded Murray. Red would be starting soon, but would get there too late to help Bat or Murray. Within a matter of half an hour, they would be attacking. From where he was, it would take them all of that time and probably more to reach them. There was no time to go back. Wheeling the stallion, he started down the valley, angling away from the group of riders. In the distance around the peaks towering against the sky, dark clouds were banking. A jagged streak of lightning ripped the horizon to shreds of flame, then vanished, and there was a distant roll of thunder. Muttering among the dark and distant ravines like the echoes of distant battle, the gray horse ran through the tall grass, sweeping around groves of aspen and alder, keeping to the low ground. He splashed through a swell, crested a long low hill that cut athwart the valley, cut athwart the valley, and turned at right angles down the draw toward the cover of the far off trees. The cool wind whipped against his face, and he felt a breath of moist wind as it shifted, feeling for the course of the storm. The big horse was running smoothly, liking the feel of running as he always did, letting his powerful muscles out and stretching them, leaning forward to break the wind and let the weight of his body help the running horse. Rock Bannon talked, speaking softly to the stallion. He knew, it was, he knew it loved his voice, for between the horse and man there was that companionship and understanding that, some, that come between a man and horse only when they have known many trails together, have shared the water of the same creeks and run over long swells of prairie as they were running now. Yet then he heard the distant sound of a rifle and then a roll of shots. Bat! I hope to heaven you're undercover, he muttered. I hope they didn't surprise you. He eased the horses running now because he must, he might rush upon some of them sooner than he expected. He slid his rifle from the scabbard and raced into the trees. The sound of firing was nearer now. He slowed the horse to a walk, letting him take a blow, his eyes searching the brush. There was still some distance to go, but there was firing, and that meant the bat was undercover. They had not caught him flat-footed, at least. We're going to hold it right there. Page 64. It's chapter 5. Love you, God bless.